All right, hello everyone. So this is uh, going to be the first video of section 1.2. Um, so remember in section 1.1, uh, what did we do? We talked about how we can use these elementary row operations. Uh, so where we swap rows, uh, add rows to other rows, and maybe multiply rows by constants to take matrices representing systems of equations and solve that system of equations, right? So we were able to sort of work these matrices down in a way that allowed us to more effectively solve systems of equations. So what we want to do this section is formalize those ideas into sort of a, um, a nice algorithm for always doing so. Uh, we will actually sort of define sort of the forms that we want matrices to be in in order to help us solve those uh, systems. And we'll just sort of look at some nice properties that go along with that. So to do so, this video, we're going to have to introduce um, a few definitions uh, and some very important terminology, which we will be using for the rest of the semester. So um, first definition, uh, given a matrix, so maybe like that, a leading entry in a row is the first non-zero entry of that row. And when we talk about first non-zero entry, we always start from the left. Um, so. Starting from the left, if I look at row 1 here, 2 is a leading entry in row 1 because it is the first non-zero entry of that row. Going down to row 2, 1 would be the leading entry in this row because it is the first non-zero entry in row 2. And finally, in row 3, 4 would be our leading entry because it is the first non-zero entry. So starting from the left in each row and working your way right, you can find the leading entries by just circling the first non-zero number you see. All right, next big definition. So this definition is sort of going to formalize the type of matrix we wanted to find in section 1.1. You'll see what I mean by that in a second, and then we're going to look at a ton of examples of this. So a matrix is an echelon form. And we'll actually say a matrix is in row echelon form. So E-C-H-E-L-O-N. And we'll often abbreviate this with R-E-F. So row echelon form, if it satisfies three properties. So if, first, all non-zero rows are above all zero rows. And so you might be asking, what's a non-zero row versus a zero row? A non-zero row is just a row that doesn't contain any zeros. Um, a zero row is a row of all zeros. So for example, let's say I had maybe another matrix here like this. Uh, each of those first two rows in my second matrix here would be non-zero rows because they contain at least one non-zero entry. And that last row would be a zero row because it only has zeros. And so this first matrix I gave has all non-zero rows. All right, so as long as all of these zero rows are below all of the non-zero rows, we're good. Next, each leading entry in a row is in a column to the right of the leading entries above. So what does this mean? So if I circle all of the leading entries in my matrix like I did in 
uh, this first matrix, and we can actually do the same thing in the second matrix. Every time I go down a row, the circles should start to move to the right. So notice in, in both of these matrices here, and we'll look at an example here in a second where uh, two isn't satisfied, but notice in each of these matrices here, if I start in the first row and look at the circled leading entry, well, I've got two there and I've got one there. Going down to the second row, I always have to move to the right to find the next leading entry. And so if at any point I don't move to the right when I find the next leading entry, two will not be satisfied. Um, you can also think of it if you were to draw sort of a line connecting all the leading entries, or draw lines connecting the leading entries, those lines should always be moving towards the right. All right, and so the last thing that a matrix needs to satisfy to be in row echelon form, uh, that all of the leading entries, or sorry, all of the entries in a column Below a leading entry are zero. Um, so this means if I have um, any leading entry, if I've circled any leading entry, that leading entry should be able to look down the matrix. So imagine sort of sitting on top of my leading entry and looking down, and all you should see are zeros. Right. So notice here, um, this first matrix actually also satisfies property three, because notice if the two were to look down its column, it would only see zeros. If the one were to look down its column, it would only see zeros. And the four, well, the four is in the uh, last column or in the last row, so it has nothing really to look down to, and so we're good. Right. All of the technically all of the uh, entries below four are also zero. And so same would be true for uh, the other matrix. And so in fact, notice both of these matrices, both of these matrices I've given you satisfy all three of these properties. And so both of these matrices would actually be in row echelon form. All right, so what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take uh, a couple of minutes to just, I think, write out four matrices on the board. Uh, what I'm gonna do then, after I've written out all four matrices, I highly encourage you to pause the video and work through each of these three rules and try to determine if each of these matrices is in row echelon form, uh, then I will uh, discuss that. So take me a couple minutes to write out all of these matrices. Matrix A, B. And we'll call that one matrix B. All right, so like I said, take a couple minutes, uh, pause the video here. Um, I will probably not pause in real life. Um, so pause the video. All right, so 
Um, I want to now discuss each of these. All right, so let's look at matrix A first. Does A satisfy all three of these properties? Well, A does not contain any non-zero rows. So one is sort of just um, automatically satisfied, right? We only care about one if we see some zero rows in our matrix. Two, each leading entry in a row is in a column to the right of the leading entries above. So to check for two, what we want to do, circle the leading entries in our row. Hmm. So notice I've got a leading entry of one here. If I go to the next leading entry two, well, that line moves to the right. So, so far, so good. But notice in row three, I've got a leading entry of one to the left of two. And so A would not be in row echelon form because it does not satisfy property two. Um, it actually also does not satisfy property three because notice this leading one looks down its column and sees a non-zero entry. All right, so next, next let's look at matrix B. Um, all non-zero rows above all zero rows. B, again, does not contain any non-zero rows, so we're good there. Each leading entry in a row is in a column to the right of the leading entries above. All right, so for two, let's circle all of the leading entries. And if I draw lines, well, those lines are always moving to the right, so we're good there. Satisfies two. Last, all of the entries in a column below a leading entry are zero. Well, if I look at each of my leading entries, they should be able to look down their column and only see zeros. When two looks down, it sees two zeros. When three looks down, it sees one zero. One has nothing to look down to, and so we're good. So B satisfies one, two, and three. And so B is in row echelon form. All right. Uh, next up, let's go to C. So now C does have a zero row, and we want to make sure that once I hit this zero row, all of the non-zero rows are above it. And so notice in this case, it is, right? So I have one zero row, and it's at the bottom of the matrix. So one is satisfied. Two, each leading entry in a row is in a column to the right of the leading entries above. Um, well, so if I, again, circle all of the leading entries, I've got a leading entry there, leading entry there, leading entry there. Notice the zero rows don't have leading entries, so I don't have anything to circle. So even though I have four rows, I only have three leading entries to check. And if I follow the lines, the lines are always moving to the right, and so we're good there. And last, one looks down and sees zeros, seven looks down and sees zeros, one looks down and sees zeros, so we're good. So C is a happy row echelon form matrix. All right, last one. This one's going to get broken very quickly because I have a non-zero row here, 0, 0, 0, 1, and right above it I have a row of all zeros. And so interestingly, notice that actually all of the other properties are satisfied. So 2 and 3 are both satisfied. Uh, but one here is the only property for D that's not satisfied, and so D would be a sad matrix because D is not in reduced, or sorry, row echelon form. All right, so you might notice looking at these matrices that um, all three of these matrices look a lot like the um, sort of matrices we were trying to work towards. Uh, well, at least C and B, right, since they are our uh, row echelon form matrices, look a lot like the matrices we were kind of trying to work towards in our last video um, that would sort of always <clears throat> inherently tell us the solution to the system of equations they represented, right? So if we were to, say, compare... Um, well, let's say we wrote out the system of equations corresponding to B, right? We would get a nice sort of definitive answer as to what's going on with the system of equations because we'd get 2x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 1, uh, 3x2 plus x3 is equal to 2, 
and our last equation would be zero raised to the one. And so by having put sort of this equation, by looking at this reduced echelon form matrix it, for B, um, what reduced row echelon form, or sorry, row echelon form, what row echelon form does for us is it gives us a matrix corresponding to a system of equations that we can almost immediately solve. So much like we were doing last video, when we have a matrix that is in uh, row echelon form, it is inherently in a sort of structure that we can solve the system of linear equations very quickly. Because again, it has this sort of, the fact that the leading entries are always moving to the right gives us this property where we can work back up, assuming there even is a solution, right? So it would be there in one. But so we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, but there's actually an even stronger, uh, an even stronger um, form that a matrix can be in. And so I've actually already given away what it's called because I keep accidentally saying it. But we say that a matrix is in reduced row echelon form. And so that would be R R E F. If it is in row echelon form and the following two properties hold. And so we'll call these properties four and five since a reduced row echelon form matrix should also satisfy properties one through three. So property four is that the leading entry in each non-zero row is equal to one. So property four, what it's saying is anytime I have a leading entry in a row, that leading entry is always one. So every single leading entry is equal to one. Finally, each leading one, and so by extension, every single leading entry in a row is the only non-zero entry in its column. So notice property three requires that each leading entry be able to look down its column and see only zeros. Property five requires that each leading entry should be able to look down and see only zeros and look up and see only zeros. So if a matrix satisfies one through three, it's an REF matrix. If a mat matrix satisfies four and five as well, as one through three. It is an RREF matrix. So again, I'm going to put four matrices on the board. What I want you to do this time is determine whether or not each matrix is in row echelon form, reduced row echelon form, or neither. And then we will talk about sort of the difference between these two forms and why uh, reduced row echelon form is a little stronger. All right, so again, we'll call them a, B, and C, A, B, C, and D.
All right, so four matrices, A, B, C, and D. Again, uh, pause the video here to determine whether or not each matrix is a reduced echelon form. Uh, sorry, echelon form, reduced row echelon form, or neither. All right, so um, starting with matrix A, well, so matrix A has some nice properties. First off, uh, there are no non-zero rows, right? So property one, which unfortunately I had to erase, is satisfied. Uh, property two, which says that each leading entry in a row is to the right of the entries above. Well, again, we can circle all the leading entries and verify that they are always moving to the right. Finally, each leading entry, when it looks down, sees only zeros. Um, all right, so A is at least in row echelon form. For each leading entry in each non-zero row equals one. Well, notice that's true here, right? Each leading entry is equal to one. But notice that five, each leading one is the only non-zero entry in its column. Notice if the ones in column two and three were to look up, they would see non-zero entries. And so here we would say that A is REF because property five is not satisfied for A. So A is just in row echelon form. B, however, okay, well, no non-zero rows, so we're good there. If I were to circle all of the leading entries, we can once again see that they're always moving right. Um, also, and we'll tackle three and five, properties three and five at the same time. Notice if each of the leading entries looks down, it's only gonna see zeros. If each of the leading entries looks up, it will only see zeros. And finally, all of these leading entries are equal to one. So B is actually in reduced row echelon form. All right, so moving on to C. Well, C is actually going to be over relatively quickly. Um, so notice, well, C just doesn't satisfy property one, right? That C has a all zero row strictly above a, a non-zero row. And so C is neither. And so we'll say C is sad. Lastly, D. Well, let's see what happens with D. Um, if I circle the leading entries of D, they're moving to the right. Um, D has one non-zero row, or sorry, one zero row, but it is below all of the non-zero rows, so we're good there. Each of the leading entries looks down and sees only zeros. But notice property four here for the coveted RREF designation that a matrix so badly wants um, is not satisfied because property four here um, wants each of the leading entries to be um, one, and in this case it is not. So D is just an REF matrix. All right, so um, video is running a little long this time. Uh, usually my goal is to keep them around 20 minutes, but we're almost done, so bear with me. Um, so I want to quickly talk about A and B to sort of discuss the differences between reduced row echelon form and row echelon form. So remember, we're doing this because we want to associate each of these matrices to systems of equations. And remember, we can think about each of A and B as being the augmented matrix corresponding to some system of equations, right? So. For example, A might be the augmented matrix, well, is the augmented matrix corresponding to the following system of equations. And who knows? We might have obtained A by taking a more complicated system and row reducing its augmented matrix to get this system. And remember from uh, section 1.1, this system is absolutely in a form that we know how to solve, right? So I could work my way back up starting with x3, and with not too much work, I could solve for the values of x2 and x1. But let's look at what b represents. So if I write out the system corresponding to b, notice what I get. 
I get a series of three equations, all of which fix all of the values for x1, x2, and x3. Because notice that the leading entry requirement for rho echelon form guarantees that I get this way to work my way back up. But the leading entry requirement for reduced rho echelon form guarantees that every single variable is going to be fixed in the equation I find it in. Right? Because you can think of leading entries as representing sort of the first time a variable, or sorry, leading entries is representing, um, you know, the, the leading entry requirement moving to the right sort of um, forces a, the variables to kind of sequentially disappear as we work our way down. But this requirement for RREF forces each leading entry to be the first time the variable shows up and to be the, really the only variable then in its respective equation. Uh, if it is going to be fixed. If it's a free variable, that might not be the case, as we'll see. Um, and so notice the RREF matrix. We don't even have to do any work after row reducing. And so this is why we like RREF matrices. And so had B, for example, been reduced from some more complicated system, we would have immediately solved that system. And I think if we were to actually... Um, no, no, actually, these two systems aren't equivalent at large. Um, all right, so I want to now go over one more theorem. So ideally, if we start out with a system now and we can reduce it to its reduced row echelon form matrix, we can solve that system only using matrix row reductions. And we'll see more of how to do that later on in this section. Um, what's also really nice is that with the reduced row echelon form matrix, we're only ever going to find one reduced row echelon form matrix. That is, each matrix is row equivalent to exactly one RREF matrix. So what do we know? If I start out with a more complicated system and I can row reduce its augmented matrix all the way down to an RREF matrix, this is the only, this is the unique and only RREF matrix I'll ever reduce it to. And this RREF matrix immediately gives me the solution to my system. So um, next video, we will go over uh, how we can actually solve systems and um, an algorithm for row reducing a matrix to uh, echelon form or reduced row echelon form. Um, I highly encourage you before that video to really, really make sure that you are comfortable uh, sort of determining the difference between REF, RREF, or neither um, by just practicing on more matrices. And, uh, and then we can move forward to how to take a matrix and row reduce it to its RREF form.